Count Data, a tale of Poisson and predicting football results. Hello, my name is Vernon Gale. I'm Professor of Sociology and Social Statistics at the University of Edinburgh, and I'm part of the ESRC National Centre for Research Methods. At the current time, due to the restrictions placed on us by the COVID-19 pandemic, the National Centre for Research Methods are unable to deliver any standard face-to-face -face research methods training courses. I hope that sometime in the near future you'll be able to join us in person at the University of Edinburgh. The film that follows is about the analysis of count data. Count data. Consider the following. How many times did you go to the cinema last year? How many people has your best friend slept with? How many goals have your favourite football team scored this season? The answer to any of these questions is likely to be a count, which means it is a positive whole number, i.e. an integer. The number must be positive because you can't have minus two visits to the cinema. And it must be a whole number because you can't make a three quarter or 0.75 visit to the cinema. Similarly, sexual partners and goals are also counted in positive whole numbers rather than as fractions or decimals. Examples of social science data that take the form of positive counts are legion. For example, how many burglaries take place in a neighbourhood? How many women under 20 gave birth last year? Or how many cases of a disease were diagnosed? Indeed, the question of how many anythings will usually be answered with a count. Given the prevalence of count data in the social sciences, for many years it has puzzled me why most social scientists know very little about analysing count data. In reality, social science data analysts tend to know more about analysing either binary, i.e. 0-1 outcomes, or continuous, i.e. metric measures. The Poisson distribution is integral to analysing count data. The Poisson distribution is named after the French mathematician Simon Denis Poisson, who was also a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and his name is one of the 72 names inscribed on the Eiffel Tower. Lord Tennyson laments that in spring a young man's thoughts turn to love. I'm a middle-aged football fan and by contrast my thoughts often turn to the final game of the season. My interests lie in Scottish League Two, the fourth tier of Scottish men's professional football. I'm a Sterling Albion fan and here I'm pictured with our mascot Bino the bear. I'm going to use an example that I developed before the final day of the football season in Scottish League 2 back in 2018. I'm going to follow an analytical approach that was used to analyse data in the English Premier League by Professor Sir David Spiegelhalter. Here I am at the Royal Statistical Society teaching a course and Professor Spiegelhalter, who was then President of the Society, came in to say hello to us. In my view, David is the greatest living British statistician. You may well have seen him on TV during the current COVID-19 pandemic, and he's a recognisable voice on Radio 4. David's a really nice fella, but he's also great fun. For example, he is the reigning, first and only, world champion in loop. This is a version of pool invented by Alex Bellos and played on an elliptical table with a single pocket in the green bays. League football matches either end in the home team winning, a home win, the away team winning, an away win, or a draw, when both teams have scored the same number of goals. Many games end without either team scoring, and typically games end with each team scoring only a few goals. There are, of course, the occasional shockeroonies, for example, when a team will suffer a 6-0 defeat. There are also occasional goal fests, where both teams stick it in the onion bag half a dozen times. In 1885, our broth thrashed Bonacord 36-0, and in 1984, Sterling Albion beat Selkirk 
20 nil. Routinely, however, most goal games end with a modest number of goals despite the large number of opportunities to score. Here is the example. As Cher would say, let me turn back time. As the last day of the 2017-18 football season approached, the winner of the Scottish League 2 was still undecided. My own football club, Stirling Albion, was due to be battling for a place in the playoff competition. When consuming a traditional half-time pie, I've often ruminated on the veracity of a Cisco approach to predicting match outcomes and final scores. Here is a list of the five games that made up the last day of the season. In this example, I'm going to bring some statistical thinking to the prediction of the outcomes of the matches and to predicting the final scores. To make things interesting, I consulted a fellow fan, a guy that's followed the club since his teens. Every fan thinks that they're an expert, but I prefer to consider this as pseudo-expert knowledge. Here are his predictions. He thought that Clyde Berwick would end 2-1, Calvin Beef and an Athletic would end 0-0, Montrose versus Elgin would end 2-0, Peacehead versus Stirling, uh, Edinburgh City would end 3-0, and Stirling Albion versus Stenhouse Muir would be a 2 all draw. I've also constructed a set of random predictions decided by a seven-sided dice. And here they are. Now let's just look at the data that have been generated by the games played in the league so far. Montrose are at the top of the table with an impressive 76 points, whereas Cowd and Beef are at the bottom of the table with only 22 points. The final game of the season for Sterling Albion will be played at home. As a fan, I would like to think of our ground, Fourth Bank, as a modern day manifestation of a Roman Colosseum where football foes are routinely vanquished and pies and bovril refresh the senators and equites. The reality is somewhat different. So far this season, we have played 17 home games and won only eight. Stirling Albion will be playing local rival Stenhouse Muir on the final day of the season. Sterling have lost four of their last five games, compared with Stenhouse Muir, who have only lost once in the last five matches. I'd like to predict the outcome of the forthcoming match and other games on the final day of the season. Sterling Albion are playing Stenhouse Muir in the final game, and as we can see, Sterling have played 35 matches. They've won 16, drawn 6, and lost 13. Their opponents, Stenhouse Muir, have also played 35 matches, but they've only won 15, they've drawn 8, and they've lost 12. The first measure that we're going to construct is called attack strength. It's a measure of how good the team is at scoring goals. Montrose, who are top of the league, have scored 59 goals. Cowdenbeath, who are at the foot of the table, have only scored 23 goals. The average number of goals scored by each team in the league is 49, i.e. the 10 teams have scored 490 goals in total. Sterling Albion have scored 60 goals, and Stenhouse Muir have scored 55. If we take a ratio of the team's goals scored over the league average, then we have a measure of their attack strength, or the quality of their attack. Sterling Albion have scored 60 goals, and the league average is 49, so they have an attack strength of 1.22. Stenhouse Muir have scored 55 goals and the league average is 49. They have an attack strength of 1.12. We can infer that Sterling Albion score about 22% more goals than the league average and Stenhouse Muir score about 12% more than the league average. 
The second measure that we're going to construct is called defensive weakness. How bad is the team at defending measured by conceded goals? The average number of goals conceded by each team in the league is 49, i.e. 10 teams have conceded 490 goals in total. There is a beautiful symmetry here, simply because when one team score a goal, the other team concede a goal. If we take a ratio of the number of goals that the team concede, goals against, over the league average for conceded goals, then we have a measure of their defensive weakness, a measure of the lack of quality of their defence. Sterling Albion have conceded 51 goals when the league average is 49. They have a defensive weakness of 1.04. Whereas Stenhas Muir have conceded 46 goals, but the league average is 49. So they have a defensive weakness of 0.94. We can infer that Sterling Albion let in about 4% more goals than the league average, whereas Stenhouse Muir let in about 6% fewer goals than the league average. There are two more measures that are required. Home average, the average number of goals home teams score. The away average, the average number of goals that away teams score. Teams scored 255 goals out in 175 matches. Therefore, the average number of goals that a home team score in a league game is 1.46. 225 divided by 175. Teams scored 235 goals away from home in 175 games. Therefore, the average number of goals that away teams score in a league is 1.34, 235 over 175. How many goals can we reasonably expect when Sterling Albion plays Stenhouse Muir? Putting the information together, we can work out the expected goals for each team. This is the information required for calculating the number of expected goals when Sterling are playing at home. The average number of goals scored by a home team is 1.46. But Sterling are not an average team. They usually score about 0.22 or 22% more. Their attack strength is 1.22. They are also playing Stenhouse Muir, who have an effective defence and have only conceded 46 goals when the league average is 49. Stenhouse Muir have a defensive weakness of 0.94. Therefore, given Sterling's better than average scoring ability and Stenhouse Muir's slightly better than average defence, I estimate that Sterling can expect to score 1.67 goals. 1.46 times 1.22 times 0.94, i.e. 1.67 expected goals. Stenhouse Muir are playing away. The average number of goals scored by an away team is only 1.34. But Stenhouse Muir are not an average team. They usually score about 0.12 or 12% more. Their attack strength is 1.12, remember. They are also playing Sterling Albion, who have a slightly suspect defence and have conceded 50, 51 goals when the average league, the league average is 49 goals. Sterling have a defensive weakness of 1.04. Therefore, given Stenhouse Muir's better than average scoring ability and Sterling's sadly slightly weaker than average defence, I estimate that Stenhouse Muir can expect to score 1.56 goals, i.e. 1.34 times 1.2 times 1.04. Now we have an expected number of goals for the two teams. It's possible to plug this information into the Poisson formula. 
In football, once the referee blows the whistle and play commences, in the 90 minutes that follow, there are many chances to score a goal, but few of these chances end in a success. In statistical terms, we might consider this as a large number of trials with a low chance of success. The Poisson distribution expresses the probability of a number of events occurring in a fixed period of time if these events occur with a known average rate and are independent of the time since the last event. Here is the Poisson formula. Lambda is the expected number of goals. And E, which is 2.71828, is Euler's number, which is a mathematical constant. K is the number of events, in this example, zero through to six goals. And K in the, the exclamation mark is K factorial. So when K is six, K factorial is six times five times four times three times two times one. So here we have the probability, which is equal to Euler's number to the power of minus lambda, the expected number of goals, times by, all in brackets, lambda to the power of k divided by k factorial. Plug in the information for Sterling Albion into this formula. For one goal, the probability is 0.8. Three, one. For two goals, the probability is 0.26. The predicted probability of Sterling scoring zero goals is 0.19 or 19%. The predicted probability of Sterling scoring one goal is 0.31, as we've seen, or 31%. And the predicted probability of Sterling scoring two goals is 26%, point, 0.26, and so on. Here are the probabilities for each of the two teams. There's a 31% chance of Sterling Albion scoring one goal. Stenhouse Muir are also most likely to score only one goal. There's a 33% chance. If we multiply... 0.31 and 0.33, we can estimate the overall probability that Stenhouse Muir versus Sterling will end 1 1. 0.13, sorry, 0.31 times 0.33 equals 0.103. This suggests that there's a 10% chance of a 1 1 result, i.e., a draw. In statistical terms, I've assumed that each event, i.e. each goal, is independent. Let's take a closer look at this chart. As a fan, I'd be delighted for the match to end with Sterling winning 6-0. But I can estimate that there is only a 0.001 chance of this result. Sterling have a very low probability of scoring um, six goals and Stenhouse Muir have a 20% chance of not scoring a goal. So the result is 0 0.01 times 0 0.21. Here are the predictions for the results of the other four matches that will be played on the final day. We've estimated that Sterling Albion and Stenhouse Muir will end 1-1 that Clyde and Berwick will end up with Clyde winning 1-0. That Calvin Beath and an Athletic will end with and an Athletic winning 1-0. And Montrose, who are very strong, will beat Elgin City 2-1. And Peterhead, also a strong side, will beat Edinburgh City 2-0. Over the years, I've noticed some striking empirical regularities. Birds fly, fish swim, and colleagues sometimes accuse me of using an outdated software package or programming language. In the examples here, I've used Python simply as a defense against this familiar ac accusation. Here is the Python code running in a Jupyter notebook. You don't get much more hipster than that. 
Um, other software though, and statistical languages are available. More complex models. The models outlined above are simple Poisson models that are the product of only a few terms, i.e. home advantage, attack strength, and defensive weakness. But we could extend these models. I'm gonna pause for a bit and get you to think about some potential ways that these models could be extended. more complex models. These models use data for the whole season, but could we put more emphasis on more recent results? We might also consider that some teams have a better or even worse home advantage than the league average. Also, there's no information on the composition of individual teams. For example, new players may have joined during the season or some influential players may be injured. It might even be advantageous to include other information, for example, on the weather or even the state of the pitch. Stenhouse Muir, for example, and a small number of other clubs play all of their home games on synthetic pitches. The sports betting companies use much more complex models than the ones shown above that incorporate more information and they also have football experts advising them. Here are the classified results. Clyde 1, Berwick 2, Town and Beef 0, and an Athletic 2. Montrose 1, Elgin City 1, Peterhead 2, Edinburgh City 1, Sterling Albion 1, Stenhouse Muir 1. The outcomes. The statistical method only predicted one correct score. It did, however, predict the correct result for three of the five matches. The statistical method beat the fan who only predicted two correct results. The dice only managed one correct result. Neither the fan, a pseudo expert, or the dice predicted any correct scores. A word of caution. We do not advocate using the methods outlined above for gambling. We stress, we do not advocate using the methods outlined above for gambling. There was a popular saying when I was a boy that it was not by chance that at my local bookmakers there were five windows for placing bets and only one window for collecting winnings. More complex models. The models outlined above are simple Poisson models that are the product of only a few terms, i.e. home advantage, attack strength and defensive weakness. But we could extend these models as we've noted above. You might also have thought of some additional information that be, could be included in the analysis. On further reflection, an underlying problem is that any score combination, nil-nil to six all, is one of 49 cells on a seven by seven grid. Each specific score has a very low probability. One technical extension might be to develop a set of confidence intervals to test the coverage of predictions. 
it might also be prudent to check if the Poisson distribution is the most appropriate distribution to use when modelling the scores in a lower division football match. Who knows, I might even get around to doing some more work on this one of these seasons. We have been discussing count data and thinking about how to use it in analysis. I said at the start of this film that examples of social science data that take the form of positive counts are legion. And I use the examples of how many burglaries take place in a neighborhood, how many women under 20 uh, gave birth last year, or how many cases of a disease were diagnosed. Indeed, the prosaic question, how many anythings, will usually be answered with a count. I also said that given the prevalence of count data in the social sciences, for many years it has puzzled me why most social scientists know very little about analysing count data. The technique known as Poisson regression estimates models of the number of occurrences, i.e. counts, of an event. The Poisson distribution has been applied to diverse events. For example, Ladidas Borchevich analysed the number of soldiers kicked to death by horses in the Prussian army. This is probably the first use of this approach. Over the years, I've read various slightly pedantic discussions as to whether or not the data were for officers only or if it included both mules and horses, but I must confess I, I don't really care. Um, Clark analysed patterns of hits by buzz bombs launched against London during World War II, and Thorndike analysed telephone connections to a wrong number. If you're familiar with regression models or the generalised linear modelling framework, then you will have seen equations like this before. In essence, there is a left-hand side, i.e. the outcome variable, and a right-hand side, a set of explanatory variables. Here they're written as x1 through to uh, xk. And then finally, there is an error term. It's easy to make the conceptual leap to have an account variable as the outcome and the regression model using information from the Poisson distribution. There are several different models that are suitable for modeling count data. The Institute for Digital Research and Education at UCLA provide this excellent page with examples using STATA, SAS, SPSS, R and M+. Here is an example of an empirical paper that has just been published that employs models for count data. A stellar early career researcher, Dr. Sarah Stopforth, and her colleagues model the number of school GCSEs gained at grades A star to C. They undertake a sensitivity analysis comparing alternative statistical models for su suitable for count data. Then they use a negative binomial regression model rather than a Poisson model because there is evidence of overdispersion. Negative binomial regression can be used for overdispersed count data, which is when conditional, the conditional variance exceeds the conditional mean. In their data set, there were high proportions of young people with zero counts, so a zero inflated model was used. In conclusion, we've been discussing count data and thinking about how to use it in an analysis. The prosaic question, how many anythings, will usually be answered with a count. Given its prevalence in social science research, it's worth learning how to analyse count data. I hope that watching this video and using the accompanying materials will help you to better understand count data and how it can be analysed. Thank you very much. At the current time, due to the restrictions placed on us by the COVID-19 pandemic, the National Centre for Research Methods are unable to deliver any standard face-to-face -face research methods training courses.